with all of you today. I'm sure so far you've been enjoying following the symposium. My name is Lydia Chabala, and uh, I'll be the moderator for the two hours in this particular parallel session. And I'm from the ITPS. Um, so during the first hour, uh, what we will do, we'll listen to four presentations and each will be 10 minutes. And I would kindly request our colleagues who are presenters in this session to stick to the 10 minutes uh, so that we can have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, so what I would suggest is that when you have gone nine minutes, I'll send a reminder just to indicate that you are remaining with one minute. And all this really is so that we have some time for question and answer session. Um, and um, it is important that in the end, we will have uh, a 20 minutes that is allocated for question and answer session. So after the first four presenters, we have 20 minutes of uh, Q and A. And then immediately after that, we will start with the second uh, one hour session where we have um, another, another presentation, another four presentation. So before starting, I think uh, I would ask you kindly to check the Zoom chat for the rules and information regarding this particular session and where it will be posted. And uh, during our Q&A session, I would request you to use the chat function. In the chat box there, you can post your questions and then we will highlight some of, uh, as you post your questions, uh, please uh, indicate which presenter your question is addressed to. And we'll be able to pick uh, one or two questions for each presenter so that they are answered live. But that doesn't mean that all the questions will not be answered. All of them will be answered, but some of them will be answered uh, via the chat uh, function. And the host for this session for technical issues is Magdalene. Uh, she is here to help us for any technical issues. So please uh, do not hesitate to write to her directly uh, using the private uh, messaging option in the chat functions. And so uh, without uh, much further ado, uh, I would now uh, like to call to the floor um, Ms. Um, Mendes, I said the last name, from Brazil, and they are presenting to us on the topic, Soil Bioanalysis, a simple and effective tool to assess and interpret soil health. Please, it's your time. Go ahead. Maybe she is not with us. Um, Let me just check. Um, is Miss Mendes in the room or somebody called Bra Brapa from Brazil? Are they in the room? Okay, it seems perhaps um, we don't. Uh, oh, she's yeah. unmuting herself. Uh, it, it was in a virtual mute. Okay. Yeah. Please, could you could you allow me to share my screen? Yes, Please it should work now. <laughs> okay, here we go. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Greetings from Brazil, everyone. My name is Eda Mendes. I'm a soil microbiologist from Embrapa, which is the Brazilian Agricultural Corporation for, for Research. And today, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity of being here to talk about soil bioanalysis, soil bio, which is this simple and effective tool for on-farm soil health assessments that we are using here in Brazil. Well, since July 2020, we are living this new moment in Brazil, where for the first time ever, Brazilian farmers now can assess how is the biological function of their soils by using two soil enzymes, better glucose days from the carbon cycle and aerosol sulfur days from the sulfur cycle. And in a pioneering initiative, Embrapa has capacitated eight commercial soil labs to perform soil enzymes as part of their routine commercial soil analysis. The choice of better glucose days and aerosol sulfur days was the result of a 20 years of research 
in the Brazilian Cerrados oxysols. Among the main advantages of using these two soil enzymes, we can say that they were the most sensitive to changes in soil and crop management practices. They are related to soil functioning, nutrient cycling, they are interpretable, precise, coherent. Then the analytical procedures involve simple and inexpensive procedures, and they can be performed directly in air dry soil samples. Also, in long term field experiments, we were able to, 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 to observe that these two soil enzymes have very strong and robust relationships with crop yield and also with soil organic matter, which is very important from, from both economic and environmental aspects. In terms of how to evaluate, soil sampling for soil bio is similar to soil chemical analysis. The only thing that changes is that we have to sample the soil at the 0 to 10 centimeter soil depth. In terms of when to evaluate, it uh, is done at post harvest, coincide with soil sampling for chemistry. And in the commercial soil labs, the soil samples can be air dried, which is really helps a lot. And in order to interpret the individual values of these two soil enzymes, we have developed uh, an interpretation strategy based on the same principles applied to soil nutrients calibration. So basically, again, in these long-term field experiments, we have these response curves where we relate soil enzyme levels in the soil with crop yields, and soil enzyme levels necessary to reach 8% of maximum grain yield are considered adequate, soil enzyme levels to reach 40% of maximum grain yield are considered low. And this is, uh, based on this strategy, we have developed interpretation algorithms, uh, which allow us to calculate enzyme reference levels as a function of the clay content. And so far, these algorithms are specific for annual crops in the Cerrado biome. And a very important uh, component of the soil biotechnology is what we call the soil quality interpretation module, which is a web platform that connects commercial soil labs to our computer servers here at Embrapa. And by using this platform, we can automatically interpret the enzymes determinations performed by the commercial soil labs. And at the same time, we can calculate soil quality indexes. The conceptual model for the calculation of this soil quality index integrates biological and chemical indicators in three soil functions. Nutrient cycling, which is related to better glucose days and aerosulfatase, nutrient storage, which is associated with soil organic matter and cation exchange capacity, and nutrient supply, which involves the acidity, base supply, and phosphor supply components. All these three functions are integrated in soil quality index, biological, chemical, and finally at the 30B soil quality index. All these soil quality index and all these function scores, they range from 0 to 1. The closer to 1, the better. And it's important to say that all these soil quality index and function scores uh, were calibrated in relation to grain yield and soil organic matter, again, using long-term field experiments. So, for instance, the soil quality index necessary to reach 8% of maximum grain yield was considered adequate. Soil quality grain yield necessary to reach 40% of maximum grain yield was considered low. And then we have these five colored schemes ranging from dark red to dark green. And scores punctuating uh, between moderate and very low, they, they are an indication that you do have major soil health constraints. And scores range from very high and high to indicate the absence of soil health constraints. Well, from now on, I'm going to show you uh, some kind of the four most common soil bio reports that we have observed so far. And all the results that I'm going to show you from now on were, the, were obtained by commercial soil analysis laboratories. Well, soil bio report type one is the best one. So here we have high scores for soil enzymes and high scores for, for soil gain matter. So nutrient cycling and nutrient storage are in a very good condition. This is how the soil the soil bio report looks like. Every line corresponds for a place in your farm. And here in the column, we do have the uh, enzyme, enzyme measurements, soil organic matter, the three soil quality index, and the three scores for the nutrient functions, supply, storage, and cycling. This soil bio report is from Planalto Farm, which is one of the biggest farms in Brazil. We are talking here about 14,000 hectares. And this is a very nice situation because uh, it's a win-win situation where we have soil quality associated with high yield. For you have an idea, soybean yield in this farm can reach as much as five tons per hectare. And we are even able to see the presence of earthworms. This is another kind of soil bio report type one. You can see all the green that we have in the screen. So it is a good indication that the soil is in a chemical and biological condition. Very good, yeah, it's excellent. Soil bio report type two has uh, low scores for soil enzymes, nutrient cycling, and high scores for soil organic matter, so, which means that although soil organic matter has not yet been affected, there is clearly a decline from the biological perspective. And in this case, soil enzymes act as bad news early warning indicators. So it's like the farm has a bomb in its soil and it explodes sometime. 
So here we can see how the soil bar report looks like. So F3 is okay, F2 is okay, but then when it comes to nutrient cycle, you can see that the soil is starting a decline from the biological perspective. Again, this is another type of soil bar report type 2. Finally, by soil bar report type 3 is the worst case scenario. We have low scores for soil enzymes and low scores for, for soil organic matter. Nutrient, nutrient cycling and nutrient storage are compromised. So uh, soil health is in a, in a really critical condition. It's an example of how the soil by report type 3 looks like. Although F3 nutrient cycle is adequate, we can see that the soil is totally compromised in terms of nutrient cycling and nutrient storage. And this is how soil bi is so important, because now our farmers can have a new vision of their soil that really goes far beyond simply that question of nutrient excess or nutrient deficiency. Here's another example of this kind of soil by report type 3, although nutrient supply is this is, is in adequate condition, nutrient storage and nutrient cycling totally compromised. Finally, soil by report type 2 has high scores for soil enzymes and low scores for soil organic matter, which means that in this case, although soil organic matter has been seriously compromised, the system is recovering from the biological perspective, as we, and in this case, soil enzymes act as good news early warning indicators. Here is an example, it's a farm in Bahia, 22% clay content oxysol, nutrient supply adequate, nutrient cycling good, and in soil organic matter, nutrient storage compromised. So, indicating that the system is recovered. And this is very important because sometimes the farmers need to know whether their regenerative man management practices are really improving their soil health or not. So, this kind of bio-report uh, helps to motivate farmers to, to, keep doing the, to keep using their regenerative practices. Well, since its launch in July 2020, we are, we've been able to create a Brazilian soil health database using that soil quality interpretation module. So far, we have around 3,000 samples in this database, and by looking at the percent distribution of soil samples in, in the classes, very low, low, moderate, high, and very high, we can see that 90% of our soil samples have punctuated high and very high for nutrient supply, which is not a surprise at all. We all knew that. We all knew, knew, we all knew that. And, but when we look at nutrient storage and nutrient cycling, we can see that 65 and 6 percent of our farms have punctuated high and very high, which is really good, because it means that the majority of, of our farms are in a good condition. And this is the first time that our farmers have access to this kind of information. So we hope that from now on, by using soil bio, we can change, we can improve the situation. And instead of having 60 and 65 percent of soil samples in this condition, we can have as much as 9 percent or even 100 percent. Right? We want productive soils and of the soils. Well, as a conclusion, I would like to say that the inclusion of these interpretable soil enzymes in routine soil analysis is important for farmers to assess whether their management practices are improving, conserving, or degrading soil reserves. In its present stage, soil bio is defined for annual crops in the Cerrado biome only, but we are talking about 35 million hectares and is simple, practical, and scalable. Currently, we have eight commercial soil labs using soil enzymes in assessing the soil quality interpretation module, but by August, we, we are going to have more than 70 labs, commercial labs, included in this project. And in the near future, we want to expand soil bio to other agroecosystems, such as sugarcane, coffee, pastures, and eucalyptus. Here's a picture of all the members of the Bioindicators project. These people have worked hard in this, during these past 20 years. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much. Um, you were actually within time. That is excellent. We appreciate that. Uh, we have some questions for you. You can have a look in the chat function, which will be answered in the end. Um, but now we would like to move to the next presenter. Um, this is Ms. Ashley from Cornell in USA. And uh, the theme of her, her discussion is uncovering linkages between soil fauna and ecosystem function using factor analysis and structural equation modeling. So please, Ms. Ashley, if you are in here, kindly unmute yourself and go ahead with the presentation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to share these ideas with you all today. I am currently a graduate student in the USA, and I am personally really interested in how we have and can link soil fauna to different ecosystem functions and services. And the foundation for how we address these questions really starts with how we group soil fauna together. Historically, soil fauna have been grouped together based on different categories like taxonomy, body size, trophic position, and other biological parameters. 
but largely we think about them within the context of their body size groupings. These groups have then been used to understand how silvana impact different ecosystem functions like litter decomposition and soil environment engineering. Other work has explored how these fauna groups respond to changing environmental conditions such as temperature, precipitation, and litter inputs. However, these fauna groupings assume that fauna's impacts on ecosystem functions is tied to their shared biology and is therefore boxed in by these preset criteria. These groupings don't allow us to explore how fauna community interactions or how changing environmental conditions affect how soil and fauna are impacting different ecosystem functions. So we wanted to let the environment create our fauna groups. We wanted to flip that mindset and instead of using predetermined groups, allow the ongoing responses of fauna to environmental conditions to create our groups so we could hopefully get a better understanding of how fauna are impacting different ecosystem functions and services of interest. There are a couple of different ways we can group community data, primarily different cluster factor analyses, but based on our goals, common factor analysis was the most appropriate. By using exploratory followed by confirmatory factor analysis, we can create soil fauna groups that are based on their overall responses to environmental conditions. I'm gonna quickly walk you through this process. Here I'm showing you an example fauna data set where you would have any number of samples that you collected and any number of taxa that you found in those samples. And as researchers, we're typically imposing different treatments that are altering environmental conditions. And as we process our fauna, we see who they are. We know a little bit of background information about them. But what factor analysis does is it ignores all that information and it just looks at the data. It searches for patterns across the entire data set that are similar between taxa. So it can end up creating fauna groups that are a bit non-traditional that we wouldn't normally think to. After creating our groups, the next step is to explore how these fauna are interacting and affecting different environmental factors. There are a couple of different ways we can explore relationships in the environment, but based on how we have created our fauna groups, structural equation modeling was the most appropriate. There are a couple of different approaches to this type of modeling, but the goal of each of them is to determine relationships between variables with directionality, which is perfect for achieving our goal of understanding how fauna are impacting different ecosystem functions. But this whole thought process didn't occur out of nowhere. It occurred within the context of a long-term cropping systems uniformity trial. So I'm gonna give you a bit of background on that experiment here now. The organic grains cropping system experiment was started in New York state in 2005. And until 2017, four different cropping systems were implemented, which varied in different cover crop types and frequencies, fertilizer inputs and tillage types and intensities. After being in place for 12 years, a legacy effects trial was conducted in 2017 to evaluate the legacy effects of these different cropping practices. To do this, the entire experiment area was treated uniformly by first moldboard plowing it and disking and harrowing it to prepare a soil seedbed, where sorghum sand grass was planted and no further management was occurred before termination. During this legacy effects trial, we collected a variety of different response variables, different soil characteristics, soil invertebrates, in this case, soil mesofauna that were collected using gray lazy funnel extractions and above ground plant biomass. What we really wanted to see was how these different factors in the environment were impacting crop biomass production. So we chose to use piecewise structural equation modeling to explore these relationships. We knew that our soil invertebrates would be an important key to understanding these processes. So we wanted to incorporate them in the model in the best way possible and that's where the factor analysis I described previously comes into play. By applying exploratory followed by confirmatory factor analysis to our soil invertebrates data, we ended up creating two significant factors that were important in our model. This first factor, fauna F1, is composed of tectosophiidae, acaridae, and phoretic hypopi, all of which are mites that fall in the order Orobata. So taxonomically, they're fairly similar, but functionally, they're interacting with their environment very differently. Our second fauna group is even more interesting. It's made up of isotomity, onocurity, and rhodocurity. So two different columbolin families and a family of predatory mesostigmated mites. But keep in mind that factor analysis doesn't pay attention to any background knowledge. It's just grouping these fauna together based on their similar response patterns across the entire data set. I applied the same factor analysis techniques to our weeds community data and ended up with one significant factor in our model, weeds F1 which is composed of yellow nut sedge, yellow foxtail and giant foxtail, all grassy weeds. And we of course included sorghum sudan grass, our crop biomass in our model. 
The next step was to figure out which slope characteristics to include. So I applied a partial least squares regression to figure out which factors were most related to crop biomass production and ended up with four that were significant in our final model. We saw that soil moisture, phosphorus, microbial respiration, and aggregate stability were important, which nicely ended up representing different physical, biological, and chemical aspects of soil health. Our final model is made up of four different component models. So I'm gonna walk you through this first one in a bit more detail so you'll understand the schematics. This first component model shows us which factors are predictive of fauna F1's response patterns. You'll see here that phosphorus is negatively impacting fauna F1 as denoted by the gray arrow, likely due to an agricultural systems, high phosphorus levels can suppress fungal growth, which would reduce an important food source for this frungiverse mites. In that same vein, microbial respiration, serving as a proxy for microbial immunity and a food source for these fauna, was positively impacting them as denoted by the black arrow. Lastly, we see that soil aggregate stability positively impacted these mites by creating an important stable environment for them. And then when we look within this fauna F1 box, I wanna point out the two R squared values. The first one is the marginal R squared, which shows us the amount of variation in the data set of the fauna F1 that was described by just those three factors, the phosphorus, microbial respiration, and soil aggregate stability. The second R squared is conditional and incorporates our random variables. And by doing that, we can explain almost 70% of the response pattern of these fauna. Now, our second component model showed us that microbial respiration was also positively benefiting this group of columbula and mites. Our next component model showed us that soil moisture positively impacted the weeds, likely because these are water loving species, especially the yellow nut sedge that are able to thrive in those conditions. And our last component model, and arguably the most interesting, showed us which factors were directly impacting crop biomass production. Unsurprisingly, our weeds F1 group was negatively impacting crop biomass due to competition for resources. We saw that aggregate stability was benefiting crop biomass production. Here in New York, 2017 was an exceptionally wet growing season, so having more aggregate stability allowed the crop to buffer against more severe weather events. Lastly, we saw a positive impact of the fauna F1 on crop biomass production. So when we put these component models together in our full model, we see two direct indirect relationships come to light. This first indirect relationship shows us that soil moisture was negatively impacting crop biomass when mediated by this weeds group because the weeds were able to outcompete the crop biomass in these conditions. Our next indirect relationship showed us that microbial respiration benefited crop biomass production when mediated on, through fauna F1, the two columbula and predatory mites, suggesting that multi-trophic interactions between microbes, columbula, and these mites were benefiting crop biomass production, likely through nutrient cycling or some other important mechanism. But the main takeaway I wanna point out from this example is that by going through this process, we saw a really non-traditional group of fauna gave us more information about how they're impacting ecosystem functions, in this case, crop biomass production. What this means for soil ecology is that factor analysis is a really good technique for identifying correlation structures between taxa and diverse data sets, which soil ecologists typically work with, especially with mesofauna where you have mites, plumble, and other very functionally and taxonomically diverse animals. When applying these groups to different modeling techniques, we can better understand how fauna change in response to their environment and how this could impact how they're influencing ecosystem functions. By using structural equation modeling, we can better understand these fauna community interactions and how they work together to contribute to different ecosystem services of interest. So looking forward, we still need to determine which taxonomic level of identification would be best to apply these statistical techniques to. Our sole mesofauna data set was identified down to family level, but a finer taxonomic resolution may benefit us with more data and understanding. And of course, we want to explore these relationships using these techniques across different environmental contexts to see if fauna are impacting ecosystem functions in the same manner across a global context. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone that made this work possible, especially Dr. Matthew Ryan and Dr. Kyle Wickings and our funding source. And I'll quickly leave you with my contact information and the citation for this paper if you want to follow up after this symposium. Thank you.
Okay, that was my microphone. Thank you, Ashley, um, for that uh, interesting presentation. It was nice to see that um, it's possible that functionally similar uh, fauna, which are similar, may interact differently with the environment. Uh, so we'll have a look in the chat again. I think you have one question, which we may ask you to answer later on. Uh, we would like to move uh, to the next uh, presenter. And uh, the next presenter is Francesca from Italy. And uh, she's looking at monitoring soil biological quality in the Veneto region. So I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So please, um, Francesca, if you are in the room, I can see you. Go ahead and uh, start. Hi. Vedete la mia presentazione? Ok, you can see my presentation? No. No. no aspetta. Vedete, aspetta allora, come faccio? Uh, come faccio? A... Oh, I can oh, condividi lo schermo, eccolo qua. Ok. Uh, we can okay. see your presentation, Francesca. Okay. You can go ahead. And if I have okay. made a presentation and a mistake in your name, just you can just correct me. No, it's um, correct. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Francesca Pocaterra. I'm a soil scientist and I work at the Soil Quality Unit of Environment Protection Agency of Veneto Region. For about uh, 12 years, our team has been monitoring uh, the biological quality of the soil in our region. I'm pleased to present you uh, the results of uh, our work. The community of organisms uh, living in the soil is highly sensitive to soil degradation. So in uh, 1000, um, 2009, Regional Agency for Environmental Prevention and Protection started the soil quality monitoring program in the Veneto region in order to investigate the soil biological quality in the region to identify references value according to different land uses and to highlight soil degradation or pollution. The soil microarthropod community was analyzed using a soil biodiversity and quality index called the QBSER, soil biological quality based on soil arthropod. This index is based on the following concept. The either the soil quality, the either the number of microarthropod groups morphologically well adapted to the specific soil habitat. In the starboard soil, microarthropod groups morphologically well adapted tend to disappear, and only those less adapted will remain. Soil organisms are classified into biological form according to their morphological adaptation to soil environment. Degree of adaptation to soil habitat depend on the presence and combination of some morphological char characters. As you can see in the picture, miniaturization, short antennas, and short legs, for example. Each of these forms is associated with a score named EMI, Ecomorphological Index, which ranges from 1 to 20. The QBSER index of value is obtained from the sum of the EMI score of all collected group, based on the principle that is more important than the degree of soil adaptation than taxonomy. If in a taxonomic group, a biological form with different EMI score are present, the higher value, value is selected to represent the group in the QBSER in this calculation. The organisms belonging to each biological taxon were counted in order to estimate the average density per square meter. The number of total taxa found was also considered. Since 2012, 10 monitoring stations have been set up in uh, Veneto region, four in plain areas, two in hilly areas, and four in mountain areas. All stations are representative of the regional environment for land use, soil characteristics, parent material, and climate condition. 18 different types of land use, of both crop or natural vegetation, have been studied, collecting at present more than 
204 QBS ER data. At each site, information on soil characteristics was derived from semi-detailed soil maps, and samples were collected for organic carbon, soil texture, electrical conductivity, and pH analysis. Climate data um, have also been collected uh, from the closest weather station, and for each area, one undisturbed sample was taken in order to measure bulk density and soil moisture. Statistical processing has been worked out with statistical software. Significant differences between the land uses in tax abundance and QBS ER index value were tested using analysis of variance, ANOVA. Statistical tests using parametric and non-parametric methods were also performed to highlight statistical variability in QBS ER index. As you can see, in plain areas, analysis of, of variance point out the relationship between QBS ER index and land use. The first one in red, arable crops, differ from whole. It has the lowest QBS ER value. Meadows in green, pro, uh, meadows, no, so, uh, sorry, uh, proves to be a good biodiversity pool. In orchards and vineyards, and the soil between the rows are, was grass covered, therefore show QBS um, high values, despite the even machinery passages and phytosanitary treatments. And forest free farming was found to be the richest habitat in green in the box, thanks uh, to low human impacts and high biodiversity shrub and tree species. Looking at the micro arthropod communities, Acari mites is the largest group, followed by Columbola and Hymenoptera. Less taxa with high biological quality and few individuals per square meter are present in arable crops. Um, in meadows, there are more taxa uh, with ME20 index, especially Protura and Diplura. In plain areas, the main factor influencing QBS ER index is land use. Arable crops have the lowest QBS ER index, number of taxa and density per square meter. The effect of some parameters were, was additionally tested, texture, uh, pH, and organic carbon, but only coarser soil texture and high soil salinity were found to provide a lower biological quality. In hilly areas, vineyard and deciduous forests have been studied. Deciduous forest showed a higher QBS ER index and number of arthropods, but the differences were not statistically significant, probably due to the short period of observation monitoring, only two years. Deciduous forests with calcareous substratum present biological quality higher that uh, then in the deciduous forest with acid substratum. In mountain uh, area, um, most common forest land use were studied. In plain areas, meadows and pastures were considered. It is quite clear that forests present biological quality higher than meadows that are more disturbed. Due to the acid litter, soil of spruce wood is less hospitable for the microarthropod community than beach forest. This fact is also oh sorry. Uh, this fact is also confirmed by a test we made by considering two samples. Beach litter seems to be more hospitable for arthropod than conifer wood litter. In beach litters, we find higher QBS ER, more total taxon, and more of triple of arthropod per square meter. Summarizing our conclusions, reference QBS ER values have been established in different venture region and land uses. As already mentioned, the index was found to be helpful to highlight potential soil degradation or pollution. And so arable crops have the low QBS ER values due to the environmental impact of farming. Meadows are the reservoir of biodiversity 
and biological richness in orchards and vineyards, uh, despite to the even machinery trading and phytosanitary treatment due to the grass cover between rows. In the agricultural land uses, uh, the coexistence of different habitats as the higher productive value for biodiversity, as well as practices preventing landscape simplification as a farming edge and wooded areas. In the last few years, different agronomic techniques effect on biological quality have also been studied, such as minimum tillage, soil seeding and organic matter, increased through digest supply. And uh, so it's all, and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Francesca, for that very interesting presentation on um, soil quality indices. It was interesting to see that uh, arable crops had the lowest indices quality compared to I uh, kindly look through in the chat function. After our next presenter, we will have a QA um, session. And so the next presenter for this part one is um, Lydia. This should be my namesake, Miss Nicola Lydia from University of Pavia in Italy. And uh, the, theme, they need the theme of the topic is uh, the biodiversity of soil microfungia in Colombia. So please, Lydia, if you are in the room. Share the screen and go ahead. Uh, hello to you all. I hope you are uh, seeing my... Maybe screen. move closer to the microphone. Uh, sorry. How is it now? Uh, 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 move closer again, try again. Can you hear me? Yeah, although it's quite faint. Uh, maybe I, I use the... Uh, better now. Better? Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello to you all. My name is Lydia Nicola, and uh, I work as a researcher at the University of Pavia in Italy. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about the biodiversity of soil microfungi in Colombia. Uh, why do we study soil fungi? Uh, soil fungal communities are at the base of carbon and nutrient cycles in soil. So they are vital for a good net primary productivity. Um, fungi in soil can have different roles. They are mainly wood and litter decomposers, but they can also be symbionts of plants like endophytes and mycorrhizal symbionts, or they can uh, attack enemies of plants like entomopathogenic fungi, uh, nematophagus fungi that attack nematodes and hyperparasite fungi. So studying soil fungi is fundamental for a sustainable use and management of the agroenvironment. Uh, Colombia is in South America and has one of the highest biodiversity rates in the world. It has been estimated that it uh, could host more than 200,000 fungal species and uh, there have been some studies on uh, fungi in Colombia, but the research was discontinuous and the focus was mainly on macroscopic fungi. The aim of our work was to provide an overview of the current state of knowledge on soil microfungal biodiversity of Colombia in order to establish a starting point for future investigations on the Colombian territory. So basically, uh, we uh, did an online literature search on Colombian soil microfungi, both in English and in Spanish. Uh, then we divided our results according to the six natural regions of Colombia. So we have the insular region, uh, the Caribbean region, the Pacific region, the Andean region, the Orinoquia, and the Amazon. Uh, we found out that the studies on soil fungi of Colombia reported a total of more than 300 identified microfungal species belonging to 126 different genera. If you recall, I said just before that the estimation of fungal biodiversity in Colombia 
is uh, uh, more than 200,000 fungal species. So we really have a long way to go and a lot to, to research. Here you can see um, a map of Colombia uh, where each point is a sampling point of uh, um, a published article on soil microfungi. And each point is uh, color coded according to the region. Uh, here in uh, purple, uh, you can see uh, the sampling points for uh, the Andean region, uh, where uh, 16 papers were published on soil microfungi. So you can see that this region was quite well researched. Um, the other regions, Caribbean, Orinoquia, and Amazon, had only five or seven papers each, so much fewer papers and uh, also a much fewer um, um, sampling points. But we can see that in the Amazon, the sampling points are quite numerous and widespread. So even if there are only seven papers, they manage to describe the, uh, this wide area quite well. For the Pacific region, uh, only two papers were published, while for the insular region, uh, the soil microfungi were never researched. So we have no information. Then we can look at the number of taxa found. And we see that most of them, uh, most of the taxa found for Colombia were actually found in the Andean region with more than 300 taxa. Then we have uh, the Amazon, Orinoquia and Caribbean region uh, with 40, 50 taxa each. And uh, finally, the Pacific region with only seven taxa. Then we can look at the, uh, at the biodiversity, so at the relative abundance of uh, uh, microfungi at film level. Uh, we see that uh, the most abundant uh, uh, phyla in Colombia were um, glomeromycota here in uh, green and ascomycota here in dark red. Then we had some mucoromycota in blue Basidiomycota in uh, pink and uh, Mortierello micota in yellow. Um, we think that uh, this uh, um, diversity we see among the region, the regions is not due uh, to uh, the difference in climate or soil usages, but at the moment is due to the different uh, techniques used for fungal identification. In fact, the techniques for fungal identification is very important. If you can imagine, uh, most of the biodiversity found in the Andean region was found just in one article, this one, um, that used a method called metabarcoding, that is a molecular method that allows the analysis not only of the culturable fungi, but also of the unculturable ones. Uh, so uh, it allows to take a picture of the soy community uh, as a whole. The most found fungal genera found in uh, Colombia were Glomus and Acaudospora, that are arbascular mycorrhizae. And then uh, uh, there were some uh, um, uh, genera that are ubiquitous in soil, like Penicillium, Mortierella, Aspergillus, Fusarium, and Trichoderma. So in conclusion, the knowledge about the biological diversity of soil microfungi is vital for a developing country like Colombia. Uh, we've seen that some areas were quite well studied, studied uh, like the Andean region, that is the uh, central region and the most populated one, so it's easier to reach for the researchers, while others are virtually unknown, like the Pacific and insular region. Uh, so it is necessary to do studies on the soil micro, microflora all over the country to better characterize the fungal flora of Colombia. Then uh, we notice that most studies focus only on our vascular mycorrhizae that are um, uh, plant root symbionts. And um, they are very important for plants but numerically, uh, it is a quite a small group. So uh, a new focus on two other fungal groups needs to be uh, done, like uh, cellulolytic and linear cellulosic fungi or potential biocontrol agents. 
So uh, further studies on soil microfungi will contribute to the optimization of agroecosystems, the recovery of highly anthropized area, and the conservation of natural ecosystem, all problems that are very compelling in a developing country. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with the Professor Angela Landines Torres of the Juan de Castellanos University in La Tunja, Colombia, and my colleague, Professor Solvetosi of the University of Pavia in Italy. If you're interested in more, we published uh, this work on the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, and uh, you can reach me at my email address. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lydia. You helped us save some time. It's quite tight to keep time. Uh, so what we will do now, I see a hand up. Uh, I would like to suggest uh, the colleague there with the hand up, is it Aziz, to kindly type uh, your concern in the chat function so that we are able to keep within the stated time. Um, I will ask one question really to each presenter. There are several in the chat. I will start with the first presenter. Uh, there was a question from Frank there uh, who noted some negative, uh, sorry, who noted that, uh, who, who is asking, did you find any direct or indirect influence of pred predatory mites on the other soil fauna? I think this question is for for Ashley, not for the first presenter. This is for Ashley. Uh, so please, in a minute, can you answer that question? Did you find any direct or indirect influence of predatory mites on the other soil fauna? Has Ashley left the room? I'm here, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. So. Our modeling was really focused on seeing what was driving crop biomass production. So while we saw that the rhodocarity were affecting and interacting with the columbola, the isotomity and onocurity, we didn't see any other effects. And that might've been due to the techniques we were applying based on our goals for that study, but yeah, no other effects. Okay, thank you very much, Ashley. And the next question, again, from the chat function, it was from Jacob. Uh, you mean she's asking there, uh, this is for Ienda Mendes. I hope that is the correct pronunciation of your name. Can you apply the technique that you were showing us there to all soil uh, types and also in different countries? And uh, also, were you able to explain uh, the high yields that were management levels uh, rather than to, uh, to, to good management levels? Uh, despite having low organic carbon. So please, can you respond or clarify that question from Jacob? And I think the other one was from Prandip. I combined them. Great, thank you. Uh, well, we can use this, in fact, this approach has been used in, in, in other countries such as China, India, and Canada. They, they were able to successfully uh, establish reference level for soy enzymes in these countries. So it is possible, but local key is research because the reference levels for soy enzymes or any other microbial indicator will change as a function of soil type and climate conditions. So local research is key. And this approach has been tested in China, India, and Canada. Regarding the low soil organic matter soils being productive, the, the key is the best management practice. Here in Brazil, we have sandy soils that sometimes are more productive than clays oxysols with let's say more than six percent of clay content so again best management best management management practices are, are the secret and yes it is possible uh, thank you very much and the next question we'll ask francesca it came from uh, uh, lena um, the question there was how do you sort out the organisms to an emi uh, numbers and also, can we consider the anthropods to be good indicators of soil health? Uh, sorry, the question there was, we can consider anthropods to be good indicators of soil health, for example, for, but what about other soil qualities? Can anthropods still be considered as uh, good indicators? I think it's a combination of a question from Lena Wells and Teresa Chapman. So please, Francesca, if you can 
have a one minute or so response to those. You are muted. Okay, okay. Uh, we think that biodiversity is always synonymous with good soil um, health. Uh, we use that index uh, as a references to identify uh, soil degradation. So um, this is a, a index uh, widely used uh, in Italy uh, to assess uh, soil biodiversity. So it's, it's, yes, um, it's a synonymous of uh, good uh, structure, but uh, good uh, porosity too, for example. And uh, for the second questions, uh, um, we classified uh, um, arthropod uh, um, with a, uh, his adaptation to soil. Uh, for example, no wings, no eyes, uh, the pigmentation are all factors that indicate a high uh, EMI, a high index. And the sum of this index is uh, more high, is uh, um, more quality in the soil. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, I think for our last presenter, Lydia, uh, perhaps we've been able to look at the, the, the chat. Uh, I saw only one question. Um, what are the main traits studied in identification of these organisms? Uh, sorry, uh, can, okay. Um, we, uh, for now, we studied just um, the, the identification of fungi is, is done in two different methods, mainly morphologically, so uh, with, uh, with a microscope, and uh, in this way, uh, we look at uh, the shape of uh, spores, the shape of several things but it is a very time consuming um, identification and very hard. So now we are uh, switching to um, uh, molecular identification. So um, we use uh, um, just uh, a PCR uh, to identify a region that can uh, let us know the species in particular, uh, now uh, we uh, we are doing uh, meta meta barcoding. So we use we are able to see with the whole DNA of a community to see all the uh, fungi present in that community. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I know there are many questions that have come up in the chat box. Please, colleagues who are giving presentations, take time to answer the questions, particularly those ones addressed to you. Uh, that will be important for colleagues who want to clarify further. Uh, so have those questions answered. Answered. Uh, I have one hand still up. Uh, I think I will allow that should be a burning issue that has kept the hand up. Is it Madame or Osa? Uh, the, your name is very difficult for me. Aga, Agazui. Uh, uh, what is your comment? A quick one. Okay, it seems maybe the hand is uh, is up by accident. Uh, so at this time, um, I would like us to move uh, to the next uh, hour. Again, the rules that are the same. Uh, we have the four presentations back to back, 10 minutes for each presenter, and then uh, we ask, we have a Q&A session at the end. Colleagues who are presenting in this next session, I'm kindly requesting you to keep um, your eyes on the chat box so that you see if there are specific questions addressed to you that you may want to consider in case I have not uh, asked it in the Q&A session. So right away, uh, we are moving to Ms. Uh, Ika Jokic. Okay, <laughs> yes, thank you. She's presenting on drivers of short to medium term litter decomposition across biomes. Please go ahead. 
Hello, everybody. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. I just see that I move much further than I wanted. Um, I am a soil ecologist by training uh, at the Environmental Agency Austria, and I'm coordinating the global Alita decomposition study, uh, tea composition, uh, on which I would like to um, share with you results on drivers of short to medium term um, uh, litter decomposition processes across biomes. Um, why does litter decomposition uh, matter? Uh, litter decomposition uh, contributes a lot to soil formation and but also to the uh, gas exchanges between the atmosphere and the biosphere. Around um, 60 pentagram carbon uh, is released annually from the litter and uh, soil organic matter decomposition. But litter decomposition also contributes to the greenhouse uh, gas production like N2O, which is about six to eight teragram uh, nitrogen per year released. Roughly speaking, we can say if we have quite fast turnover, then we have probably a positive uh, effect to the uh, 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 climate warming. And if we have a, a moderate or slow decomposition, then we would uh, rather have a uh, carbon sequestration. Um, today, I would like to show you the results uh, from the global to regional uh, levels uh, collected through this um, decomposition initiative, uh, where I would like to show you the patterns and drivers uh, at a global scale, but then use experimental approaches uh, uh, to more, go more into detail and to see what are the direct and indirect effects uh, in the forest ecosystems, but also what are the drivers or how to disentangle drivers on such huge uh, gradients, um, environmental gradients in the grassland ecosystems. Um, I mentioned briefly this global litter decomposition initiative, we call it tea composition because we work with standardized litter, namely commercially available tea. We use for this um, green tea that decompose fast and uh, rooibos tea that uh, decompose slowly. And what we do, we basically weigh them tea bag and buried under the ground and collected after a certain time and measure the mass loss. Uh, the initiative has started in 2016 and so far we have 570 sites involved in the in the uh, in this study and around 300 sites in aquatic um, ecosystems. Uh, here I would like to share you the results from three-month uh, incubation period. You see on the uh, y-axis the remaining mass and the, on the uh, x-axis you see the biomes, uh, climatic zones uh, organized from, from uh, cold to warm. In the green you have the decomposition of the green tea and in red of uh, uh, rooibos tea. Uh, basically, what you can see that average remaining mass of uh, rooibos tea is 72% and of green tea 40% across all biomes, which means green tea decompose across all biomes um, in a similar uh, way. Um, when we look at what which parameter mostly contributes to the explanation of this pattern that we have seen, and we see that the litter type explains about 65%, um, and that, that green tea decompose fast uh, uh, um, is also probably due to very high amount of um, soluble compounds, um, especially after three months, um, that causes faster, faster decomposition. But when we look at the climate, it's quite lower amount of uh, explanatory power. Uh, you, you should bear in mind, which I didn't mention at the beginning, is that um, we started a very harmonized approach, meaning that started um, in southern and northern hemisphere at the same time of the year, uh, in this case in summer. And the whole three months incubation was um, data were obtained during the summer, which means we didn't have any extremes that could maybe lower or damper the decomposition. Therefore, the climate effect was rather small. But when we look at the uh, nitrogen deposition at this early stage, uh, this was also quite low. Um, 
Then I would uh, jump over to the uh, one experimental setup where we look at the litter decomposition at a regional scale across the Europe. Here um, we try to see how climate change, air pollution, especially nitrogen deposition uh, in different soil with different um, uh, land use legacy uh, would affect the uh, litter decomposition, again using uh, the standardized litter, um, namely rooibos tea and green tea. Uh, for this, uh, we uh, have run a structural equation model. Uh, you see again here the data for three months um, and is organized according to different uh, soil uh, types. We, ha we have your oligotrophic, mesotrophic and eutrophic soils. And on the left hand side, you have these uh, stressors or drivers uh, and then uh, to the right, the different type of um, these. What is common for all the three types of soils is that we have direct and positive Im impact of temperature and light on pl plant cover, but plant cover then again has rather negative impact on the decomposition of the green tea, which means uh, Although we have at the beginning a positive effect of climate, then this effect is turned around to the, to the plant cover. Um, we also see that the uh, different type of soils, um, the effect, these direct and indirect effects um, uh, are strongly, uh, differently strongly exp expressed. And um, I don't have time to, to to go in detail of each arrows, but it is very interesting to see really clearly that different type of soil matter. Yeah, as I said, positive direct effect offset by indirect effect uh, to the understory plant cover and uh, the different soil conditions influence the litter decomposition is basically the main message. Uh, then uh, we had another um, mesocosm study, uh, study also through the whole, whole Europe, uh, where we uh, try to disentangle what is the effect of climate, soil, plant cover on the, um, but also microbial community through the soil on the litter decomposition. Uh, these mesocosmos, we call it phytometer, are made from local soil and standard soil. And they have also standard plant uh, composition as a um, widespread uh, grass species. Uh, that were planted on both on standard soil and on the on the local soil and a bunch of parameters were um, measured but i would like to present you only the the composition of the tea uh, i know that's a quite overwhelming table but uh, just to guide you through um, we have here the composition data after 12 months uh, here are the different drivers in the beginning climatic variables then we have a more drivers related to the microbial activities and then principal component of uh, bacteria um, and principal component for uh, fungi. Uh, the first two green ones uh, relate to the composition of green tea ones in local soil and in darker color and to the standard soil and the same here for the rooibos tea. Basically what it says and which model best explains uh, the decomposition of different type of uh, uh, teas is when we involve the uh, contribute, contribution on microorganisms. So I think in the previous to a study, we have seen how different type of soils affect much the decomposition. But here, when you go one level deeper into the organism, then you see that these models are quite strong. And then if you look up to the climatic variables. To sum it up, <laughs> at the global scale, we could see that at the early stage litter uh, decomposition, litter quality was the most uh, driving factor, but the climate was moderate, uh, probably also due to incubation during the summer times. But here I have to stress, it's just a one view of this global study because the global study runs over several years and we, have, uh, we will have our long-term data. When we look at the re regional scale for the forest ecosystems, we, we could see that direct effect from the climate could be reversed to the plant cover, which has exerted rather negative uh, influence on the decomposition. 
the, in the forest ecosystems. And then if we look at the other original scale uh, in grassland ecosystems, we could also see that microbial composition was much stronger uh, explanatory variable um, on the decomposition of both um, litter types, especially in the soil. Here we are uh, waiting for more in-depth analysis that we can understand much better relationship. What is the difference in standard soils comparable to the local soil? Uh, what are the perspectives? I think I, I shortly introduced this um, idea of using standard litter and uh, uh, value of getting this harmonized data uh, to really um, be able to make inter-site comparisons, but also comparisons across different networks. Uh, I also mentioned that we have around uh, 570 sites uh, uh, already collaborating in this network, but still we have um, underrepresented areas, which is a quite pity because the methodology is so suitable, especially for the areas where we don't need a lot of resources and, uh, and we are always have not so much data. Uh, let's say in Russia, in Southern America and Africa. Uh, so we would be happy if the community would like to join and um, uh, collect the data on the decomposition in this area which is also find uh, that since the methodology is very simple, it can be also used to educate kids in the school, what are the functions of the soils, but also you would collect the data in this initiative to teach the graduate student to work with the global data and also learn how to tackle issue on the global challenges. So at the end, this is the website link. Please have a look. We have also protocols in different languages uh, and contact myself uh, if you would like to contribute. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that interesting presentation, Eka, looking at drivers of uh, litter decomposition. And I think you mentioned uh, like soil type as well as litter type where things that are among drivers of litter decomposition. Uh, colleagues, if you have questions uh, for her, please um, type them in the chat function. Uh, now we'll soon be moving to our next uh, presenter. I can see it's ready there, almost sharing the screen already. Yeah. And uh, the theme of the presentation is litter decomposition and organic matter turnover by soil fauna in a sustainably managed olive roof. Mr. Andriano Sofa from Italy, please, uh, it's your time. Thank you, Lydia. And I hope that you can hear me and see me. Um, my presentation is um, focused on litter decomposition due to the activity of soil fauna in uh, uh, an agroecosystem, a Mediterranean, agro uh, Mediterranean agroecosystem is an olive grove managed in a sustainable way. This, uh, this ecosystem, uh, this grove is located in uh, Ferrandina, it's in the south of Italy. It's a beautiful grove in a hilly area. Uh, it's a mature olive orchard with uh, plants uh, that have uh, almost are 100 years old. And uh, it was split in two parts, uh, one sustainable and the other half conventional. So we have fo followed this uh, this field since 2000, so it's now 21 years of differential management. And uh, in the sustainable plot, we adopted the no tillage, guided fertilization, and uh, drip irrigation. Uh, we treated municipal wastewater, uh, light winter pruning, and uh, the pruning material was cut and left on the ground as mulch. So a lot of uh, carbon inputs in this, in this plot. The other plot uh, was totally different. It was managed according to the local uh, uh, management practices. So it included soil tillage, mineral fertilization, empirical irrigation with uh, a lot of water, heavy pruning and the uh, pruning residues were burned and uh, removed from the, from the field. So we have compared these two systems. And uh, the aims of, the, of this study uh, were uh, to uh, 
uh, focusing on the importance of natural potential of soils, especially from a bi biological point of view. In the Mediterranean soils that we uh, analyzed, there is a very low level of soil organic matter and soil fauna can contribute to ameliorate these soils, especially and soil, soil fauna, is in, uh, as you, we will see later, is uh, improved by sustainable management. So the role of soil fauna, especially of microfauna, uh, is important not only for food production, for agricultural production, but also for a wide range of ecosystem services. And uh, we also follow with physical chemical parameters, carbon and nitrogen dynamics, uh, liter and soil organic matter decomposition. And we compared uh, these, these parameters between the two, the two systems. So we hypothesized that a better management, a friendly management, a, a sustainable management, eco-friendly man management, uh, can enhance, can uh, improve the abundance uh, of macrofauna and this macrofauna has very deep effects, significant effects on soil fertility. Um, we, uh, at the beginning, we studied, uh, of course, the most important parameters for chemical fertility, so soil organic carbon and total, soil total nitrogen. And uh, in the sustainable systems system, uh, the, le the levels of soil organic carbon and total, total nitrogen were higher compared to the conventional. These are the data after 18 years of sustainable management. You can see the difference in the presence of litter only in the sustainable plot where there are cover crops, while the conventional plot was, uh, in the conventional plot, the soil was totally, completely bare. So in 18 years, we observed a very a significant increase of soil organic carbon. And usually this is normal because when a soil is cultivated, we lost uh, more than 50% of organic carbon. And uh, it is possible to reverse this trend applying uh, sustainable practices. But uh, what is the contribution of uh, uh, soil fauna to this process? For, understanding, for trying to understand this, uh, we as uh, counted earthworms, so in uh, different points of the, the orchard, uh, the, the, to the total weight of earthworms and the main mean weight of earth uh, earthworms were uh, calculated, were measured. So you can see the difference here between the two systems and also the total weight and mean weight of other macrofauna. Uh, this was measured in uh, 25 uh, centimeters per 25 per 25 blocks of soil. And we measured also bioturbation and using mesh bags uh, with and without holes. Uh, these holes uh, uh, allowed the, um, the microfauna, the, the entering of microfauna in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mesh bags. These uh, the mesh bags were filled with a mixture of artificial soil. And this was due, di, di, why? Because uh, it was possible to observe the tunnel, the tunnels and the bioturbation of macrofauna, especially of uh, earthworms, in the artificial soil that it is, uh, is completely white. And it was possible to see the biogenic structures of the earthworms, so the entity of, my, of bioturbation. So we measured this, uh, you can see here the biogenic structures in the, in the, in the artificial, within the, the artificial soil, inside the artificial soil. And these, were, these are the uh, cores, uh, soil cores uh, recovered after one year. You can see here some of them. So we measure the dry weight of biogenic structures that are related to bioturbations, to macrofauna uh, activity. Uh, we are particularly interested in this, in this kind of uh, mesh bags with holes. Uh, so 
we measure the activity of earthworms because the holes were about approximately one centimeter of diameter. And at the same time, uh, we also calculated uh, solid organic matter decomposition using a, a liter, a characterized liter of, from olive from the same field, the same olive grove. And we measured the decomposition compass constant that was higher in the sustainable plot compared to the conventional one. This uh, either after 90 days and after one year of decomposition, you can see here some of the leader beds that we used. Why soil phone is so, is so important? Because uh, soil macroporosity, that is uh, an indicator of physical fertility, uh, is higher in the sustainable plot. And this macroporosity is due to agricultural techniques, but also to macrofauna activity. You can see here some thin sections of soil uh, at uh, 10 centimeters or uh, 10, 20 centimeters deep. deep. Uh, and the white parts are the macropores. Compared to the compacted and uh, co uh, conventional soil where macrofauna was less abundant. So see, this parameter is very important because on this param these parameters also affect uh, soil sto uh, water storage into the soil. So you can see the difference here of water sto storage soil water content in the two systems per hectare. And the cover crops also allow the uh, less soil losses, so less erosion. So in conclusion, soil chemical, soil chemical and physical quality are important, but soil biological uh, activity, especially the activity due to the soil, soil fauna, but also to my, my, microorganisms, to bacteria, to fungi, is, is very, very important uh, because soil fauna plant interactions are very important in, in, because they affect soil crop production, but also a wide range of ecosystem services. The role of soil fauna should be seriously taken into account in land management strategies, especially in very vulnerable soils like Mediterranean soils, arid soils. And so soil fauna has a key role in soil quality and fertility. But uh, this role is extremely important because soil fauna is affected by chemical fertility and physical soil fertility, but also affect soil chemical physical fertility. And this be the benefits of a sustainable practices are uh, various. They can be commercial, ecological, institutional. And there are a lot of benefits for the farmers. You can see here the cumulative yield of olives in the first in the, uh, in the first year of the experiment, you can see the higher olive yield in the sustainable plot. So I thank you for attention. This is our research group, and uh, uh, this research was inspired and uh, within a KISOM cost action. And uh, I also invite you to the second international electronic conference on plant science where I will be the chair. So if someone is in, is interested in this conference, can contact me. And I really thank you for the attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, interesting presentation. I hope you can hear me. I'm having a challenge. Magdalene, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, so the presentation was very interesting. They are showing the role, uh, the key role that so found a play in ecosystem services and sustainable land management. It was interesting to see how areas where sustainable land management are being practiced uh, have um, higher carbon, nitrogen, and bioturbation compared to where there was uh, no sustainable land management in the conventional system. Uh, so please uh, have a look in the chat to address, I think I saw one yeah. question. Um, at this time, we would like to move to our next presenter. Um, our next presenter is, um, uh, forgive me colleagues if I don't put your title, Dr. Prof and all others, uh, it's Mr. Frank Ashwood uh, from the UK and he's giving us a presentation on developing 
a systematic sampling method for earthworms in and around Deadwood. So please, this is your time, go ahead. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Brilliant. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for um, who tuned in for this. Uh, I know you've got lots of choice uh, this afternoon. Um, I just got about 10 minutes. I'll try and wrap it up quicker if I can to make time. But um, yeah, I'm, I work for Forest Research in the UK. My name is Frank Ashwood. And I just want to talk about uh, my attempt to develop a systematic method to look at earthworms in Deadwood. So why are we interested in Deadwood? Well, hopefully everyone appreciates how important it is uh, for soil biodiversity in forest systems. Uh, it's both food and uh, shelter for a whole range of invertebrates, um, including earthworms. There's a whole load of earthworm species that might not actually live in soil, but might actually live in Deadwood and other habitats above ground. The problem is we don't actually know a great deal about them because most of the traditional approaches we take to looking for earthworms involve looking in the soil. Um, there's as yet no quantitative methods for systematically looking for earthworms in non-soil habitats. Uh, and as a result, we might be missing out on information about their distribution of these, these species that don't live in soil. Uh, we might be assigning wrong kind of conservation statuses to those. And we might not really be getting a clear idea of the ecological value, uh, the true ecological value of, of Deadwood. So this was a pilot study that I developed a couple of years ago now um, that was trying to overcome that lack of uh, methodology. Uh, and the aim was quite simple. It was just to try and um, develop and trial a systematic method for looking at, at looking for earthworms in Deadwood, but um, also then compare that against traditional approaches that would just look in the soil. So the location for this study was in southeast England in the UK um, in Alice Holt Forest, which is part of the Environmental Change Network's long-term monitoring site, and uh, identified 12 stands of oak, uh, so Quercus roba, and in each of those stands, uh, I marked out a 10 by 10 meter plot. And then within that, surveyed all of the deadwood for volume in that, in that area, and then selected five pieces that I was going to systematically um, investigate, and then dig five soil pits, traditional soil sampling pits for earthworms. And then beneath the five bits of dead, deadwood that I was gonna look at in each plot, I also dug a, a soil pit to see what earthworms were living in there. All of the dead wood that I, I surveyed, uh, I'll talk about a bit more in a moment, was in um, a decomposition class three and four. Now, um, I don't expect many people to know about this, but there are ways that you can associate um, and classify decaying wood based on how degraded it is. And uh, from the literature and other pilot studies, um, it really seems that earthworms don't move into decaying wood until it's medium to late in the decay process once all the you know, other invertebrates have got in there and made the bark loose and decomposed the wood. So I focused on, on those types of decaying wood. I've got references at the end so you can go and look this up. So the, uh, the methodology was pretty simple. Um, as you can see in the plot uh, in the top right there, the schematic, um, first off, those five X's, those are where we generally dug soil pits. So we excavated the soil, um, like in the previous talk, 25 centimeters by 25 centimeters, um, and hand sorted that for earthworms, and then took measurements on soil moisture and soil temperature, because those are very important environmental parameters for, for earthworms. We then, uh, yeah, we collected the earthworms from there and preserved those. We then found five pieces of deadwood that we were interested in studying, measured the temperature beneath the bark of those with the same probe, and also collected the organic material that had accumulated beneath the loose bark, because that's kind of like the soil environment that the earthworms live in, in, in the deadwood. We also measured the deadwood um, for surface area and volume. Uh, and we moved it aside and dug a pit beneath there, took the same soil measurements. And then in the deadwood itself, we, we dismantled it. We looked in the, uh, the moss, any loose bark, and where possible, we looked inside the decaying wood as well to try and um, collect the earthworms, which we preserved and then took back to the lab for identification to species level and also uh, to um, determine the biomass of the earthworms that were within the decaying wood. So coming on to results, uh, this is a table just of the uh, abundance, the average abundance of the earthworms in those three habitats. And I'll just quickly run through a few points. Just to say, firstly, uh, the soil habitat itself, just the open soil, uh, was 
significantly greater in earthworm abundance and biomass as we might expect. Um, it had a large number of species found there, um, but uh, and we found about six species in the soil that we didn't find in Deadwood. Conversely, though, we did find an earthworm species in the Deadwood surveys uh, that we didn't um, get in the soil. So this was uh, this species here, Icenia fetida. It's a, a composting earthworm. It's called the tiger worm here in the UK. Uh, people in uh, Europe and North America might be familiar with this one. Stripey, it lives in your compost bins. Um, and also we, there's another species by Mastocyceni, which is another surface living earthworm that's associated with trees. Uh, we found significant greater numbers of that in the deadwood as well. And here, uh, the deadwood has been associated, uh, the deadwood earthworms have been worked out for the surface area of the deadwood so that it could be compared to the surface area of the soil data. Teasing apart the, the earthworm community data a little bit further, just to look at the life cycle, the life stages of the earthworms that are happening in these habitats. Um, it was really interesting to see that actually the, the deadwood had a much greater, a significantly greater proportion of juvenile earthworms in it compared to the surrounding soil habitats. Um, and correspondingly, a reduced proportion of adults. And what that suggests is that the deadwood was providing a refuge and a habitat, uh, particularly for juvenile earthworms, um, before they then move out into the soil habitat as adults. So to summarize the main findings, the main results, um, one earthworm species was found in the deadwood only, and there were six species found in the soil only, um, as I mentioned in the first um, table. Uh, the, on average, the deadwood added around 20% of the total earthworm abundance data for that 10, 10 meter squared forest plot and about 10% of the overall biomass, earthworm biomass data. So quite a good contribution from the deadwood that we surveyed uh, to our picture of what's happening in those forests. As I said in the last slide, the deadwood also had significantly greater percentage of uh, juvenile earthworms. And that was associated with the specific environmental conditions that we found in the deadwood. So beneath the bark in the organic layer, the organic material that had accumulated there where we found most of the earthworms, you can, you can see it in that middle image at the bottom there, that dark stuff. Um, it was around 78% uh, moisture content, which is really high compared to, so it was significantly higher than the 24% moisture content in the surrounding soils. It was also uh, one degree C warmer on average, uh, which is important when considered that we were looking at this in, in autumn, so it was quite cold. Uh, and that helps to explain why those juvenile earthworms were there in such greater abundance, because juvenile earthworms are particularly vulnerable to moisture and temperature. Uh, and it looks like the uh, deadwood was providing a much more um, comfortable environment for them. Interestingly, we found that the soil beneath Deadwood was actually less habitable uh, than the surrounding soil for earthworms. There was a much reduced earthworm populations there, and that needs more investigation. Um, but this was one of the first studies, I think, where people have actually, where we have um, associated earthworm density in Deadwood per meter squared of the surface area rather than the volume of the deadwood, which is what most people do. Um, but because, considering that most of the earthworms were living on the thin, just beneath the thin layer of bark, um, it makes more sense to do it by surface area. Um, and also it has the benefit that earthworm, um, normal soil earthworm calculations are provided per area of soil. So it makes them directly comparable. So I urge anyone else that does this kind of thing to consider that approach. Just to conclude, and then I've got a couple of take home um, points. Um, we did find that including deadwood in our um, woodland surveys improved our idea of our um, estimates of the earthworm populations for those woodlands and also gave us an, an additional species for our species richness um, calculations. Oh, hello. Someone's taken over screen sharing. Uh, please, uh, not yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> Keen, uh, I'll get back. Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, what was I? Yeah, so the uh, deadwood surveys, though, because we found a lot more earthworms in the soil than in the deadwood and more species in the soil than we did in the deadwood, um, I'm not suggesting that we should go out and survey deadwood only, um, but it's more to be considered as a holistic addition to traditional soil sampling uh, surveying for earthworms in forest systems. I just want to finish with a couple of next steps for anyone who might like to collaborate. So um, there is a little bit more, this was done two years ago and I haven't been able to 
put any time into it since. Um, there are some other experiments going on there um, in the Netherlands, uh, Wageningen, they're doing some really interesting stuff. If anyone from there is here today and wants to talk, that would be great. I'd like to pick this back up again if I can. Maybe we can roll out into alternative microhabitats beyond Deadwood, so looking at stones and rot holes and other interesting places that earth hunters may live. The technique could also be applied to other invertebrates, so we could look at springtails, mites, uh, and other important soil invertebrates. And also just to get an idea of um, what earthworm species really are utilizing deadwood, um, because we can only identify adult earthworms, um, one thing that could be done is take cocoons from deadwood and either incubate those up to adult stage or also just DNA sequence them and see what earthworm species are utilizing those habitats. So thank you very much. Please feel free to get in touch. Um, uh, I'm far too active on Twitter, so you can find me on there. Um, and if you want to look at the papers, um, the QR code on the left there is the original research publication, which is um, open access in forest ecosystems. Uh, and then this was represented for um, younger audiences in the, in the really good Frontiers for Young Minds uh, Soil Biodiversity edition recently. So you can find that following the link there. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm impressed that you had a paper for young minds, uh, as you found uh, juvenile uh, <laughs> earthworms in the dead. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was an interesting uh, presentation there. We noted from your work that actually there was uh, one particular species of earthworm that was exclusively in uh, dead wood compared to what was in the soil. So I think there is one question for you in the chat. Please have a look at it and uh, try to answer it before we have a live interaction. Uh, colleagues, we have come to the last presentation. Please hang in there so that we listen to this last presenter on soil biodiversity and uh, physical hydraulic function. How earthworm and plant root interaction contribute to ecosystem services. Mr. Jamal, now it's your time. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. You hear me? Yes, we hear you, your screen. Yeah. OK. This is Jamal Hala from uh, INRA of Morocco. And uh, today I'm going to, to talk about, uh, sorry, just to move this. I'm going to, to talk about how earthworms and plant roots interaction contribute to uh, ecosystem services to soil water regulation. Uh, as most of you know, uh, earth, earthworms process the soil. And as they are eating the dirt, they are making burrows that makes what that brings water uh, deep into the ground to the aquifer or to the drainage system. But this water flow uh, depends actually on earthworm species. There are some species, any six for example here, they, they have more impact on vertical flow than lateral flow. Other species like on digit species, it's like a balance between vertical and lateral flow. For the PGX, they act more on the soil surface, the, uh, the upper 10 centimeter surface, and they have more uh, effect on lateral flow than vertical flow. So, and this, uh, this water is brought to, to, to the soil and uh, they help to buffer extreme events. Uh, timing and magnitude at at uh, at field scale and uh, in re at, at regional scale. Uh, the problem is that uh, most uh, laboratory uh, works that has that have been done until now, they uh, they may experiments in conditions where the the earthworm burrows are connected to a drainage system. So this is not always the case because uh, earthworm burrows they have ends. So the water within the burrows is more a matrix flow than posoic conditions flow. What do I mean by posoic conditions flow? If we consider here this uh, earthworm burrow as, uh, as a tube, uh, uh, as a tube with both sides open, we can see in first case here that uh, when in conditions when burrows are not connected to a drainage system, uh, the, the flow within the, the vertical flow within the burrow is more uh, is more uh, depends more on core diameter. Okay. In second case here, when when uh, the burrow has an end, the flow within soil is more matrix flow. It depends on the on, on the on the on the matrix characteristics characteristics on the length of the burrow, the diameter, and on other characteristics like soil organic matter uh, 
and uh, mean, meetings other. So uh, our, in uh, this little crucial uh, detail is not taken into consideration in many studies. So here, this, this is what we did in our experiment. So uh, also, uh, earthworms they live in uh, in covered area where, where they interact with the plant roots and. Uh, uh, Plant roots, they have also impact on soil water flow as earthworms do, but not at the same extent. Uh, but they make biocores that, uh, that really, uh, that, uh, that control water flow within the soil. So here, what we did is that we, we tried to see this uh, interaction between earthworms and plant roots on soil water flow and, and, and soil uh, physical characteristics. We tried, this, uh, 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 we tried this on different species of earthworms. So we made lab experiments with two earthworm species, Eteristis and Colorotica. This is a vertical uh, borrowing earthworms, and this is a lateral borrowing earthworms, and another field experiment. Uh, so this talk is, is separated into parts. The first part I'm going to talk about our results on uh, lab experiments, and second part about uh, our field experiment. For the ex uh, uh, lab experiment, we did uh, uh, the first experiment was on Elteristris, uh, which was uh, combined to uh, uh, winter wheat. And so the experimental design was of uh, 48 columns with soil textures and with and without earthworms and with and without plants. So we did the uh, same experiment for Elteristris with vertical borrowing, uh, uh, with, with vertical borrowing behavior and for Chlorotica with lateral borrowing behavior. So, uh, and uh, the, the columns were put under lead lights. We measured PAR uh, radiation. We irrigate them, we, we, we irrigate the plants and we put uh, horse manure to feed the, the earthworms at 15 degree Celsius. After 16 weeks, we measured unsaturated hydroconductivity, saturated hydroconductivity, soil water release curves, water stable aggregates, water holding capacity, and plant shoot biomass. So what did we find? Here, the chart shows the unsaturated hydroconductivity and saturated hydroconductivity on, uh, uh, in the experiment where vertical, uh, vertical earthworms were tested. So the y-axis here show the mean hydroconductivity, and x-axis shows the different tensions applied to measure the saturated hydro conductivity. So each tension here is corresponding to a flow within uh, a particular uh, pore size. We, we will only focus here on saturated hydroconductivity when all the pores of the soil are filled with water. So what we see here is that uh, uh, actually uh, water flow in the presence of interstices, it was more controlled by plant roots. However, the interaction between plant roots and uh, and earthworms has the most impact on water flow, but this was only significant in sandy loam soil. For the eclortica with lateral borrowing uh, behavior, we found that there is that earthworm that actually uh, control water flow within soil. We can see that all the columns where only earthworm were added or are uh, in interaction with the plant roots, they have very high uh, water flow. And the, the, the value of, uh, of uh, hydroconductivity is far more uh, greater than the one for uh, interstress. This chart here shows, shows uh, the, uh, the, the pore size contribution to, what, to water flow. We'll focus here on sandy soil and only on pore wider than three millimeters. So what, what we can see for Eclortica that at the end of the experiment, the water flow within pore wider than three millimeters or was the same for uh, when uh, earthworms uh, interact with wheat and when only earthworms were added to the columns. Uh, for interstress, the water, the water flow was more controlled by wheat, either with the interaction with, uh, with earthworm or without. Here, uh, the chart here shows the water holding capacity for interstress, we can see that there is an impact of uh, wheat 
uh, the presence of wheat in the in the in the columns, but the uh, the impact of the interaction is not really significant except for the silt loam soil. For Eclortica, we can see that there is uh, an, uh, the interaction between earthworms and wheat roots. The has a, a, a very big uh, impact on water holding capacity within all the soils. For water stable aggregates, again, for interest rates, no significant differences, but for Eclortica, we can see that the interaction has a very significant uh, uh, effect on uh, water stable aggregates. So uh, this is a uh, second experiment, the field experiment. So the, the aim of this study was to determine the effect of earthworms on soil recovery when arable soil is converted to lay. So uh, the, the, uh, the aim actually is, was to clarify the extent of which the action of earthworms as distinct from other practice managements uh, give rise to uh, improved uh, soil characteristics. As you can see here, we, the experiment was made on uh, monoliths. In strip, in strip place here. So the, this was done. Uh, the uh, the the monoliths were extracted from four arable uh, arable soils containing st strips here. I can explain after what uh, why these strips were made uh, after uh, the in the in discussion. So the. The soil was taken here. We made many measurements, and the, the, the soil, the fields has a, a, a historical uh, uh, arable uh, uh, practice. So, what we have done here is that we took seven monoliths, we defonate them at minus uh, 20 degrees for three weeks, then we grow clover and wheat on them, we put fences. And then we separate them in in uh, four four fields here. There are three monoliths with, which were frozen, but they don't contain any earthworms. Three monoliths were, uh, where earthworms were were added, and one control. And we are uh, yes, this is the uh, the earthworm diversity which would uh, which was added to to the monoliths with earthworm addition. So we have made two uh, uh, inoculation of earthworms in, uh, uh, during the year. Then the monoliths were put at the end of lay lay strips, and during the experiment we measured seasonal uh, measure, uh, hydroconductivity and plant shoot biomass. And at the end of the experiment. We actually measure water release curves, water holding capacity, bulk density, and other characteristics. So here, here is uh, this chart shows the uh, earthworm's diversity found in the monoliths at the end of the experiment. So what to, what we see here is that in monoliths with earthworms addition, we find we found actually the, si the same numbers of earthworms as we put uh, in the first. Uh, at the start of the experiment, but the uh, species, the diversity was different. We, we see that the, there are many on the GX earthworms than other sp species uh, compared to uh, to uh, the start of, of the experiment. For for monoliths, we're only uh, where that was defonated without earthworm addition. We, we found that there are uh, some. Uh, Four tools in there. They are uh, most of them are uh, EPGX. Uh, the, maybe they have colonized uh, the the monoliths, even if we have put uh, defense over them. Here, uh, this chart here shows the hydroconductivity during uh, seasonal change in hydroconductivity during the experiment. I will move to the, the end of the experiment uh, that, that we can see that there is a very uh, a significant uh, difference in hydroconductivity between the start of the experiment and the end of the experiment. So, uh, here also, there is an, uh, an increase in hydroconductivity, but it was not uh, significant. Chart here shows the water uh, release curve. We can see with the addition of earthworms, the, the curve shifted to the right and the water, uh, hold, uh, water at saturation is significantly higher than uh, the other treatments at field capacity also. And the, the water available to plants was also significantly higher than uh, other treatments. 
for water holding capacity, it was it, it increased by nine percent. For bulk density, it was not significant between treatments, but for organic matter, it increased by nine percent. Water stable aggregates by fifteen percent, and total nitrogen content by three point five percent. Maybe you can conclude. Uh, we have yes. Uh... Okay. Okay. Right. So for uh, for uh, the mean uh, clover, we, we we can see that at the end of the experiment, uh, the the clover uh, biomass dry biomass has increased by fifty eight percent. Okay. So at the end, we can see that uh, the combined effect uh, the combined effect of earthworms and winter wheat showed the greatest effect on soil properties. And also that lateral burrowing earthworms like Chlorotica has more impact uh, than vertical burrowing, maybe because we have changed uh, the setup of, the exper of the, our uh, experimental design. Uh, also for the field experiment, uh, our results uh, suggest that earthworms play a direct, uh, a direct and significant role on the improvement of soil quality when uh, Arable was converted to lay. And this is because, uh, and, uh, this is why we should all, we should uh, boost uh, earthworm populations in uh, our practices to ensure success, successful, sustainable, and reclamation on and soil quality improvement. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, and these are the the published paper during this work. Thank you. If you want, just uh, keep in touch, and I will give you all these papers. Uh, thank you very much. That was an interesting presentation there showing the effect of earthworms on soil as well as the soil moisture characteristics. Thank you very much. It's very tight to keep time uh, on uh, online presentations, but we try. So I'll ask uh, maybe not all questions, but each presenter perhaps may have a minute or so to just answer or clarify. I know you've already handled most of the questions in the chat. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, so I'll ask them at random, just for the benefit of the other colleagues who didn't have a look in the chat. Uh, there was one question from Mr. Dewi. Uh, forgive me for the names again. Uh, the question was the address to Mr. Ashwood. And uh, the question there was, how did you measure earthworm population density on dead wood per square meter uh, given that the dead wood is not evenly spread the area, so kindly clarify. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, sometimes with dead wood, it's quite hard to calculate the surface area because it's irregularly shaped. So we did our best to treat it a bit like a cylinder. Um, but uh, it was, the calculations were based on the surface area of the deadwood itself rather than the soil that it was on. So you, if you take the, the length and the diameter of, of the deadwood and assume a cylindrical shape uh, or a cone shape, then you can work out the surface area. And because the earthworms were living under the bark that was on the surface uh, of the deadwood, um, ecologically, it makes sense to, to treat it that way as well. And it was quite useful because it, we, we calculate earthworm density in soil in the same way. Um, so you can actually make them directly comparable, which is useful. Thank you very much for that uh, answer. Uh, those who didn't follow, I think I saw it answered also in the chat. Uh, then there was one question that was addressed to Adriano. It was from Rasmin Javad. Uh, the question there was, what was the role of kaolin in the mesh bags? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. And uh, the kaolin and, uh, and addition, additional to sand uh, formed a kind of uh, artificial soil. This artificial soil has the same texture, approximately the same texture of the soil, the normal soil, but it is white. So after one year, when we recovered this, uh, this soil, these this cylinders, we observed the activity, the bioturbation of activity of uh, the earthworms inside this artificial soil. It, it was very clear, visible, because it was uh, brown on a, a white, uh, white background. And at the same time, we managed to recover the biogenic structures uh, secreted by the earthworms. So it's, it, it's, it is a way to observe clearly the bioturbation in a white background. 
Thank you very much. So I Great. think that was clear and I saw it also taken care of. And uh, we have another, maybe last question is, um, it was addressed to uh, Ika, uh, who was talking about uh, liter decomposition. Um, I think it was, the work was done in Europe. The question there was from Jato, I think. How viable is it to apply the work on liter decomposition on other latitudes? Yeah, um, as I mentioned, we have uh, run the study across 570 sites worldwide and also in different climatic zones, even in the high Arctic and the mountain regions. So basically method you can apply everywhere, <laughs> even in the aquatic ecosystems. Great. Uh, one last question has come for Jamal. Uh, being a last presenter, I'm sure people didn't get a chance to digest your presentation. But there's one last question. Did you investigate the behavior of earthworms in composted soils? Actually, we, we did, uh, we did uh, investigate the effect of earthworms, not the behavior. It's, it's not my, my work to do uh, the, the behavior. But we have seen some behavioral actions that we, uh, I, as I said, that uh, some ways were actually, the, there is no, uh, the, some ways were defonated. And after that, we saw that, uh, yeah, we found the EPGX earthworms in them. Maybe there the were cocoons inside that uh, were not affected by high uh, fro frozen uh, conditions in the, in the freezer. But, and also, uh, we didn't actually, we just work on arable soils, not on composted soil. I don't know if this answers his question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So colleagues, it has been a very, interesting session. We've learned uh, quite a lot, interesting work going on. So quality indices, monitoring the drivers of um, litter decomposition, uh, how soil fauna can contribute to sustainable soil management. Uh, then there is the biodiversity of the microfungi, uh, where we learned that more research actually is needed. And uh, also the the, the role of fauna in ecosystem functions. And there was one interesting question which was raised, is there a database for soil organisms um, and biodiversity? Uh, does one exist already? Um, so there's much work that has gone on, but also we know from some of the papers that were based on review articles, uh, that particularly the one on microfungi that um, not much work actually has gone on, for example, to map the biodiversity of, the, of uh, microorganisms. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. So it has been an interesting session. I hope we've made some contacts, some networking, I think in the chat, um, links and papers uh, were shared. So hopefully we'll be able to link together. So before I close, uh, maybe Isabella, you would like to say something. Isabella is one of the main organizers of the symposium. Um, before I just bring the session to a close, would you like to say something? Isabella, are you there? Okay, I'm seeing that Isabella is not there yet. Uh, so I would um, ask Magdalene, is there anything that you have from the organizers? Nothing, okay. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for joining. Please uh, be ready to join tomorrow also. It has been an interesting session. So we would like to close today's parallel session. And thank you for keeping the time. It was not easy, but we made it. Thank you, colleagues. Enjoy your morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lydia.